I'm not living to see revival. I'm living to see Jesus. Yeah. I'm not living to see miracles. I'm living to see Jesus. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Iris Global Green Room podcast. Today, we have my good friend, Liz Gleam. Everybody say hi to Liz. She's incredible. You're going to get to know her. You are not going to want to miss this episode. Listen, we do this podcast because we love you guys and we want you all to grow. Uh, so do us a favor, if you don't mind, just go down, hit subscribe if you haven't, uh, leave a comment, hit like, do all the things. It just really helps us get these out and bless people. And today, you guys are going to be blessed by my good friend, Liz. Liz, how are you? I'm doing good, Will. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, if you didn't catch last week's or two weeks ago's episode with Stephanie, Liz, if you watch about the first 10 minutes or so, 15, uh, an incredible God moment happened with Liz and Stephanie, uh, where you actually ended up going to her church. Yeah. Yeah. I went to her church, uh, her dad's church. Yeah. Where her whole family went yeah. um, in Worcester when I was in college years and years ago. Um, no way. Yeah. 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 So that was really cool. I, I obviously haven't seen Stephanie since then. Um, so that was, I was special to me, you know, the, yeah. It was a holy moment. Uh, yeah. It, it, it just felt amazing to, to see her, to honor who her parents are, yeah. you know, and who her dad was. There's a lot that I love about you, Liz, but I would say up at the top of the list is your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing you love about me. I do. I, I love it. I feel. It's so great. I don't like it's it and so I don't know how great. to use it. So it's so great. Your Instagram is one of the best out of all the missionaries. Okay. Uh, <laughs> because you're like real deal. Not that others aren't, but you have snakes coming to get you. Uh, you work on the farm, the iris. You actually manage and run the entire iris farm, and you run into some crazy critters, and you eat crazy critters. I think I saw you eating rats. Yeah. Oh man, I got in like big trouble for that. Why? Because people were like, "That's really gross. You can't like do that. You're going to get sick. You can't like portray that image or whatever." What? But you know what? Like, Hold on, who are, who are these people? They shall remain nameless. But people, people trying that to, you know, people that I know, trying to give me good advice, right? But here's the thing: I got to share the gospel with three Makandi mamas, yeah, because I had a rat hanging out of my mouth. I've eaten rats in the village, and they're pretty delicious. And can we call them field mice? Yeah, that's much because better. Because yeah. I'm not eating a sewer rat, right? If it doesn't, if it's not something we kill on the farm. I don't want to. I, I wouldn't yeah. eat a village rat. They are rats, technically species wise, but right. they live their fields. So they're, they're field mice. Yeah. So, so we dig them up while we're clearing land on the farm, mm -hmm. you know, and we'll kill them there, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, dispatch. Yeah. Just cook them up. What's your, what's the craziest thing you've eaten? I don't Is know. it rats? I guess probably. Have, you get a lot of snakes. A lot of snakes. And not just like you get deadly snakes. Yeah. So this year, can I tell a story? You tell whatever you want. Okay. Um, this year, for the first for the first time, we had one of our workers get bit by a black mamba. So we've killed black mambas before, but no one's, gosh, in ten years ever been bitten by one. Mm. And so they're a very deadly snake. Um, and it's like ten o'clock at night, and Mario calls me, and he's really panicked. Our guard has just been bitten by a black mamba out in Miezi, which is you know like yeah. a twenty minute drive, and he's not doing very good. So if you get bit by a black mamba, usually it affects your respiratory system. Yeah. You go into respiratory failure and. It's like a couple hours you die? Is uh, that 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the most deadly snake, I believe, in Africa, if not Southern Africa. Like yeah. It's, I think it's one of, it's like on the top, top list. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Has some of the most potent venom. Yeah. Um, and we've had neighbors, you know, die from snake bites mm -hmm. and things. So 10 o'clock, I jump in my truck, drive out there, and we get there, and he's laying on, on the concrete floor of the, the health clinic, which there's nobody there. But yeah, right. obviously they took him there. And so we throw him in the back of the truck. And at this point, he's, I'm, I'm trying to talk to him. He's responding, but I can tell he's kind of like coming, coming in and out of being, you know, super responsive. So we're driving into Pemba, and then I start hearing him going into respiratory failure, you know, and he's doing the. <gasps> how, how long had, had, had um, he been bit? I'm thinking we're, we're right, about, right about an hour at this point. From the time he got bit to the time that Mario found him, got the phone call, called me, I drive out there. We're, yeah. we're right around an hour. Okay. He starts going into respiratory failure. And so I, you know, Mario and I are just praying. Mm. And so we just prayed all the way into Pemba. 
And we took him into the hospital, and the hospital in Pemba doesn't have any anti-venom. So when we took him in, he's not breathing. I mean, they didn't, they didn't even have oxygen to give him, you know. So we put him on a bed, and I think, you know, I was kind of watching the nurses, and they gave him, um, like, an antihistamine. Mm-hmm. Like they, you know, an I, antihistamine. An antihistamine. It's like, what they had. I okay. mean, they wanted to treat him with something, right? Yeah. So I looked at the, the, the little glass bottle after mm-hmm. the lady gave him the injection. It was an antihistamine, and I thought, bless her heart, you know, that's sweet. He needs a touch from the Lord, though, yeah. or he's going to be gone soon. And uh, we just stayed in his room and uh, just kept praying over him. And he's just, you know, and after about half an hour, he starts to kind of slow down. His breathing kind of regulates a little bit. And uh, when he had gotten bit, the the snake had left its fangs in his foot. So, Like they ripped out of its mouth? Yeah. And I guess if a, if a, if a snake or a mamba yeah. particularly deposits all the venom it has, especially mm-hmm. if it's a young snake, it can't really regulate its venom, it will drop all of its venom in and leave its teeth in there. Really? And so he had, his, he had the, the teeth in there, the, the fangs. fangs. Yeah. So we knew he got a good dose. This wasn't like a little one. Right. Yeah. So we knew he had a full dose. Um. And his leg just seized up. I mean, hard as a rock. And so the doctor was like, well, his breathing's coming back. So he's, you know, but then it was like, is he going to lose his leg, you know? And uh, he stayed in the hospital, I think, five or six days. First first day, couldn't move. Second day, you know, he kind of started to move his leg around. You know, then he started to bend at the knee. And uh, fourth day, you know, it was just the foot that was really hard and in a lot of pain. And then by the fifth day, he just got up to go to the bathroom. And we were like, you can, go, you can walk on that? And uh, so how after, common is this for someone to make it through a, a mamba, mamba bite? with that much venom? I don't think it's very common. I've never heard of. Yeah, I've never heard of anybody surviving it without anti venom. No. no, well, we, we prayed. Come on, yeah. You you witness a lot of miracles. You watch God move constantly. Your stories blow my mind. <laughs> they really do. They they really really do. But listen, let's rewind this a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, you, number one, you're one of the most requested, uh, teachers on our online missions training course, which people can sign up for if they want to. Yeah. Irisglobal.org. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're one of, you actually are, you're one of the most favorited speakers because you're so real, you're so raw and you just get right down to it. And there's no, <laughs> there's no, uh, yeah, there's no fluff. Nope. Okay. So Liz. Just really quick. Yeah. How did you end up in Mozambique? Because uh, a lot of people want to go. Yeah. A lot of people went to the school, but you're there. And you've been there how long? 10 years. 10 years. You're coming yeah. up as one of the longest long-termers. <laughs> I think M was 13. My sister was 13. Yeah. Yeah. And there's others. I think Rafa and Anna. Rafa and Anna yeah. have, have, I think, like 16 or 17 so, years. So yeah. you have made your way into legendary status. And you know what happens when you get like legendary status? I didn't plan this out. I actually just, what? you know, Stephen Ross. Yeah. You get, you get your face on a t-shirt. Oh gosh. I hope not. That's no. their wedding photo. <laughs> right. I love our missionaries. I literally make, I literally make t-shirts with their faces on them. Uh, Stephen Ross, wow. legendary status. They've been there. Like they are years. legends. Yeah. They're legends. They're incredible. So you're working your way up to legendary status. Okay. And yes, there will be a, a t-shirt. Uh, 3999irsglobal.org. I'm just kidding. No, I'm joking. Uh, I'm being stupid. How did you get there? Uh, long story short, um, one of my good friends invited me to hear a speaker at her church. Mm-hmm. It was actually at Regent University. It was at her university. And we went. It was Heidi. Um, I thought she was crazy. It was yeah. pretty nuts. If you've <laughs> never heard Heidi speak or been around her, it's, it, it's just wild. Um, so after that, I was intrigued yep terrified so i googled what is iris you know and at that time this is like 2005 six seven somewhere 2008 yeah. i don't know the website was basic yes <laughs> but down in the corner they had this thing that said iris farms like they just bought a farm yeah and that really intrigued me um i come from you know small farming community in central ohio I grew up my uncles are farmers mm-hmm. Studied agriculture at Ohio State, love farming. That's and at the time I was working for a greenhouse company, doing you know, plant production and stuff. So that interested me. Um, so I clicked on it and it pulls up a, an email address and I was like, so I sent an email and I said, what What do you grow? You know, yeah. I don't care about missions. I want to yeah. know what you're farming. Mm-hmm. 
And I get a reply back that says, uh, come visit. Okay. So I remember I asked my dad. I was like, dad, I got a... Uh, How old are you at the time? 23, okay. 24, yeah. maybe. Yeah, 24. I'd finished school. I'd finished university and was working in Virginia at the time. Yeah. And uh, anyways, my dad, I told him, I shared it with my dad. He's like, I'll just go. And I was like, okay. So they said, they said, come for a month and, and, and come work on the farm. Just come see the farm. So I went. And at that time, like, I didn't, I didn't stay on base. And so Pemba has a visitor center, right? Mm -hmm. So most visitors, which I didn't know, yeah. they go and stay on the base. And then from the base, you get oriented into this is the church and the school. And these right. are the opportunities right. we have for you to serve. And this is all that we do. I got picked up from the airport and driven straight to the farm. And I stayed at the farm. I think we went into Pemba like maybe two or three really? times. Yeah. Who was running it? So Jeff, Jeff and Heidi Reed were running okay. the farm and they were living out there. They'd build a house oh. out there. They were living out there. So I didn't know any different. You know, I, we went into base a couple of times for yeah. church, but I was, I didn't understand. Let's just paint a picture. So Pemba is like a little peninsula island. It's not an island, but it's like yeah. this, like. It's a peninsula yeah, with a city a peninsula. in it. And then uh, the airport's there, you know, 10 yeah. minutes from the base. Yep. Um, but the farm's about 40 minutes. Yeah, half an hour. Half hour yeah. outside of town. And, yeah. And outside is like, it, it could be an hour or two hours, like dirt roads. Bush, and, bush. Yeah, bush, bush. Yeah. So. Very isolated yeah. at the time. So I stay out there. I have, and I stay out there with this amazing family, incredible time mm -hmm. with them. I stay out there a month. Love it. Oh, man, I loved it. And uh, finish up the time, and this couple, Jeff and Heidi, are driving me to the airport, you know, kind of debriefing me. How was your time? You know, mm -hmm. what did you enjoy? And uh, they say, hey, we just, we just want you to pray about this, but we would like to, to ask you to consider doing a harvest school if you would like to come back here. And uh, so I just, uh, I thought, okay, you know, and when they said harvest school, all I knew was the farm. And mm -hmm. if they were giving me, you know, kind of an invitation to come back and serve with them on the farm, mm -hmm. I thought it was a farming school. So I get home and, you know, my dad's like, hey, how was it? And I share with them and he's like, well, are you going to do this harvest thing? Wow. I'm like, yeah, sure. So I apply. Um, and the application, you know, people are like, well, didn't you see all the required reading and all this? Didn't it give you yeah, a... Yeah, yeah. I just thought they wanted us to be like super missionary farmers. Like, of course, I would read Surprise's book if I'm going to go grow corn. Like, yeah. that makes that made sense to but me. But harvest school, harvest farming. Yeah. 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 That's what it is. It's a farming school. It's a farming school. So I, I went and it wasn't a farming school. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the only person I've ever heard in all the 40 schools now that's ever thought it was a farming school. But I like it. So that's how I. I'm happy. That's how I got to Pemba, to Mozambique. Yeah. yeah. So you went to the school. Went to the school. Um, for people, there's a lot of people watching that want to go to the school, want to mm -hmm. go to a school, want to go to Mozambique. Can you, what was the experience like? Wild. Why? I didn't grow up in a super charismatic movement at all. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I heard Heidi speak once, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm going because I'm interested in farming. Yeah. I think a lot of other people went with different, you know, different agendas or different things, yeah. you know, and I hadn't been exposed to the Holy Spirit like that before. I hadn't been exposed to radical joy. You know, I hadn't been exposed to um, Herbert telling me to die for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> scared me to we death you, when, he, when he spoke. I do. I love Herbert. Yeah. I have the most respect for him. He terrified me as a student. No, oh, he terrifies me still today. I'd never He's heard that message. Friend. Yeah. Um, but what marked me was people were giving their lives for this. It was it was simple. Yeah. You either give everything to Jesus or you don't. And and I got I got really I got really touched by the Lord there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Yep. I mean I'm gonna do farming. It's probably not gonna be very radical for Jesus, but you can have you can have my yes and that's it. And I remember writing my dad an email once. I didn't we didn't really talk much so I was at harvest school, you know, this is back years ago. So it wasn't like you could message or or FaceTime at all. And I remember right. writing him just a short email and being like, this this is something that I feel I want to do the rest of my life. And, wow. he, and he was just like, go girl. You know, this like short little dad text. Replies. Was that your first time out of the country? No, I had been to, oh, I yeah. had been to Haiti when I was um, spring break of my senior year. Okay. My dad sent me to Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this is your first like moving out outside uh, of going to college, right? Yeah. You're on your own. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had, so when I finished college, I had moved down to Virginia okay. and was living on my own down there working. Okay. So I've, I've been away, okay. but 
moving. Did you have the language? Oh, gosh, no. No language? No, 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 okay. no. I didn't have the language when I went back as a long-termer. I'm still learning the language. Yeah, but you speak really, really well. So you go to the school. Yeah. Did you have this thing, you have an encounter with the Lord or I, no? I would say I had several. Like what? Just describe it. Uh, encountering his presence. And to me, his presence felt terrifying it, it, in, in the sense of the fear of the Lord came upon me and I'd never felt that before. And it was the fear of, of wow, he's so holy mm. and I'm such a sinner. I was on the ground not because I was weeping with joy. I was on the ground because I was weeping at who he was mm. and how worthy he was and how unworthy I realized I was. I think, you know, Peter's like, he sees Jesus give him a bunch of fish and he's the first thing he says is I'm a sinner. Right. And I think that uh, that resonated with me. Like yeah. the Lord came near and I realized I was unclean mm. and I wanted to be pure. Um, yeah. And, and I'd never like experienced the Holy spirit like that before, you know? I mean, watching people fall all over the place, and I didn't really think it was. I was. I didn't sure what it was. You know, I didn't doubt it, but I was like, "Well, what does it mean? <laughs> What's going on when you're on the floor?" You know, and then you know, waking up one day and being like, "Wow, I was just, I was just in the presence of Jesus," and I don't remember going on the floor. I don't remember. I just remember waking up and going, "Okay, something in me wants more of this mm. at I whatever it. it costs." So at that point, by the end of harvest school, I was like, yeah, I'm all in. Yeah. I mean, I knew, I knew going there, like, I'm going to do this 10-week course, and I'm going to come back and serve as a farmer. Yeah. And I remember talking to my roommates and everybody else, and they're like, I don't know what I'm here for. Mm. I'm just seeking the Lord. And I'm like, well, you came here with no direction, <laughs> you know? It's funny. You came with direction, though, but it wasn't you, – you wanted to go to a farming school. Uh, yeah, I came right? here with direction. Direction was to go and, like <laughs> – yeah, I guess. But it, but it, but it flipped it upside down, which I think mm -hmm. is actually a a lot of people's experience with harvest school. They yeah. come there thinking it's going to be whatever yeah. they pictured it, yeah. right? And they go yeah. and it's a lot of worship, a lot yeah. of time in His presence, a lot of yep talking to the Lord, right? Yeah, and and a lot of people don't handle that well. They don't navigate that well. They want to be told what to do: do this, don't do that. These yeah. are the ten steps. Yeah, right. And you're a doer, big time in the best way possible like it's a it's so incredible how, how was it sitting there for two months um i was fascinated <laughs> it wasn't hard you know i think on fridays you had what they call practical missions so yeah. you could go out and do right so you had your classes in the morning and then after class you could go into the village right mm -hmm. so i didn't ever feel like there was nothing i could do everything was it was it was a big classroom to me it was uh, i could learn you know yeah. And, and I didn't go there knowing a single person that was going to speak. I didn't know what a guest speaker was. I didn't know anybody that spoke except for Heidi. I hadn't even seen Roland before. Yeah. So I wasn't like, uh, every person was, wow, that's interesting. Wow, I never heard that before. Oh, that's kind of cool. So I was just fascinated with it, the whole sitting and learning. Yeah, I'm here to be a sponge. If you're going to go to a mission school, don't go with an agenda. You don't know anything. Go as a sponge. Sorry, can I say that? You say whatever you want. Yeah, go learn. Uh, do you see? Do you feel like a lot of people come to our schools or go to the missions field with an with an agenda? I mean, I you have to have vision, right? Vision's amazing, but go to learn. Go with an open heart. A teachable yeah. spirit is a powerful thing, and I think a lot of people go like, "This speaker's here, and they carry this message, and this mm. speaker's here, and they carry this anointing, and this speaker's here, and they come whether they realize it or not with an expectation. If your expectation isn't Jesus, don't go to school. That's so good. Jesus is the expectation yeah. and the prize. Yep. He's the reward. And all these people have different things to share with you about Jesus. So you say that with confidence, and I agree with everything you just said. Did you have that going into it, though? I didn't know what to expect. Right. But somewhere along the way, you're like, this is all about him. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that for me came from listening to Roland. Yes. And I was like, I... Your love for Jesus is so attractive and contagious. Mm. That's 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 it. Yeah. That was pretty early on. I mean, day one. Yeah. You hear Roland speak and you're it, like, it's it, all about Jesus. It's mind boggling. Yeah. The depth in, in Roland. Yeah. And the fun. Like it's it's great. Yeah. Okay. So you go to the school. Yeah. You get this focus and then Yeah. You you get launched. 
I get launched. Okay. Uh, finish the school beginning of December. Mm-hmm. Gonna go home for Christmas. Uh, spend Christmas with my family. Yeah. And then uh, plan was to go back long term. Beginning of January. Wow. And since then, you've now it's now been ten years. Ten years. You've lived in an active war zone for seven. Yeah. Seven of those ten years. Mm-hmm. You've seen. Couple cyclones, the best of humanity, the worst of humanity. Yeah, you've seen chaos that most people never, ever, ever will even understand what that taste is. But I think yeah. the beautiful thing is you've seen Jesus in the midst of it every time. Listen, I want you to share whatever you want, but yeah. I would love to hear some of the things that you've watched God do, some of the stories that you've seen in the midst of all of your journey right out there yeah because you anytime i talk with you i hear just the craziest things what's god done this year or whatever it doesn't even matter yeah we're only a couple of weeks into this year what's god done in the last year or before it doesn't matter i just want to hear like what are some of the things that have impacted you the most yeah being in mozambique and watching what what god's doing (laughs) um man Jesus is calling his bride. That that's, and he's moving and calling people. Like, I think we hear a lot of times like Jesus is showing up, you know, to Muslims and right. these Muslim nations, and Jesus walks in the room, and right. Jesus is doing this. He's he's doing that around us as well. Mm. You know, um, one one of the highlights for this year, I think, there's two things that come to mind this year, and one of the things was um, this man that came in to the farm, and so. Uh, where the farm is situated now, we used to be in the bush, bush isolated, but now because of the war, the government's used the land around us to resettle um, a lot of refugees. Um, and it kind of starts across from the farm and kind of goes up, you know, another five kilometers. And, you know, the last two or three years, we have done everything we can to just be available and be present first, you know, for our farm family and second for the community around us. Yeah. Um, and that looks like all kinds of different things. But, we have a container out at the farm that we keep, you know, just a shipping container. We keep, you know, tools, supplies in there. But we started two years ago, you know, people would, you know, kind of send some money or we would get donations for things. And I just go buy plastic water buckets or like grass mats or we'd get extra food from distribution, you know, bags of rice or, or shima and stuff. And we keep it in there. Um, and our farm manager, Mario, phenomenal man yeah. of Jesus. Phenomenal man of Jesus. He is my hero. Mm. Anyways, he and I sat down and, and we were like, no matter what, nothing's more important than anybody that walks into our farm that, that needs help. And so he's a Makandi man, and a lot of folks are coming out of these these areas, Makandi villages, yeah. right? So they they come to Miezi, and he starts to kind of get this reputation. There's a Makandi man that helps people out at this farm. Yeah. And so people get placed out at this farm, so they're walking to, to where they've been placed in the camp, and they hear there's a Makandi man there that'll help you. So they come into the farm. And they kind of ask for anything, right? They have nothing, yeah. you know? And so whatever we have, a capulana, a yeah. bucket, yeah. a bag of rice, we give, we pray with them. Most people don't Bibles. understand what poverty is. Like you see it. It's at, when you say nothing, it's nothing. They don't have chinelos. They don't have flip-flops on their yeah. feet, yep. you know? They fl- they're fleeing for their lives. They left. Their houses were burned down. A lot of times they don't even know where their family members are. Right. Um, so anyways, that, that's a, an ebb and flow mm-hmm. yearly through the farm, people that come in and they're desperate. I mean, a lot of times they haven't eaten in a couple of days. A lot of times they have a child that needs a medical need. So anyways, they'll usually come into the farm and they'll sit in our, we call it the refectory. It's kind of just a little pavilion at the front of the, the property. And then, you know, someone will come and get Mario. I, hey, there's somebody here. Um, and, and we'll leave the field, whatever we're doing, walk up and meet with these mm. people and just just sit with them, talk to them, pray with them, you know, whatever we can do to help them. And so this man comes in this year, and he's an elderly guy, I would say probably in his 60s, by Mozambique standards, that's, that's old, elderly. That's elderly. Right? Yeah, that's old. Um, he's, he's this beautiful Makandi man, and he's there. And so Mario and I sit down with him, and Mario starts talking to him in Makandi, you know. And I'm and I'm and I'm thinking I'm gonna go open up the container, start getting some stuff out. And Mario's like, "No, you just wait, just wait." And uh, and so we wait. And so he obviously tells us his story. And then Mario said he'd like an axe. 
And and I was like, okay, what, what else would he like? You know, what, what does he want axe? You know, and Mario said, no, no, he just wants an axe. And I said, what about asking him if he wants food? You know, can we give him some food, you know? And he and he had shared in his story, you know, he had three daughters and they had children. So we know he has kids, he has grandkids, he has a wife, you know. And we knew the village he had come out of, you know. Um, and we knew he had nothing. And Mario, you know, talks to me, looks back, and Mario says, no, no, he says, please don't give me food. I've and never seen that never ever. Never. In all my years. Never have I. Have I ever seen anyone reject food in Mozambique? Ever. Ever. <laughs> ever. And I've never had anyone show up and ask for an axe. Yeah. So so I'm like, okay. And so he starts talking some more. And then he says, do you have a solar Bible? You know, they call them yeah, little yeah, radios. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, yeah, we have solar Bibles. Of course, of course you can have a solar Bible. Everybody gets a solar Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so Mario just, I can just see Mario listening to this guy. And he just starts beaming, you know. And so then Mario translates. And he said, uh, this gentleman said, give me an axe so I can go make charcoal for my family. Mm. He said, don't give me food. If you give me food, I'm going to eat it. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you for more. Wow. He said, give me something to put in my hands and give me food for my spirit. Give me a solar Bible so I can feed my soul. Come on. This Makandi man puts that into words. Give me food for my soul and an ax for my hand. And you won't see me again. And, and we did, and I've never seen him again. He never, he's, he's, he's never come back. It's crazy. This man, and, and, and so, yeah, we, we, we were sitting there talking to him, and I, and I asked him, I'm like, what, what church? And he said, there's a, there's a little Pentecostal church in the village that he grew up in. He's never heard Heidi speak. He's yeah. never heard, you know what I mean? Yeah. But he encountered Jesus, yeah. and he knew to sustain him and his family, he needed the word of God mm. and something to, to do with his hands. I love it. And it was like he walked out of there, and I was like, this man is the, has the applause of heaven over yeah, his life. Yeah. He's going to care for his family, and he's going to meditate on the word of Jesus. Wow. I, it's funny because I think some people listening, they don't, they might not get it. Like, like yeah. they, oh, he asked for an ax, like, but ax and a Bible. But just the fact that somebody's asking for a Bible is that wow. it wasn't like that when I was a missionary out there. Like, yeah. Nobody wanted it. I mean, revival was happening, but it was just, nobody was asking for this. And then everybody was looking for something. Yeah. It's for free. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To, to hear that, it's, it's crazy. And it, and, and, and how many people come into the farm and they, they ask for Bibles before they want food. Right. And you know, I, I used to hear Roland talk about that after the mm -hmm. floods. And I was like, I never believed I'm it. like, yeah, right. I, I know, I know how desperate people riots are over food. I've been in riots. Yeah. But it's true. There's a hunger for God. And you know what? Like, like Mozambicans know what physical hunger feels like. They grow mm -hmm. up in it, unfortunately, a lot. But they can't stand spiritual hunger because mm. that'll kill you, you know? Yeah. And they're, they're hungry for the word of God right now. Mm. And that's, that's the most powerful thing, you know? So you're living, I don't know if you ever think about this, but you're living in a revival, in the middle of a revival of a nation that has changed, yeah. right? From before Jesus started moving through Iris, right, in Mozambique, mm -hmm. and now, like, Cabo Delgado, I believe it flipped from a, from a Muslim province to a Christian province. Mm -hmm. Like, you're living in the midst of a revival, and then you come back, like a legit revival that history is being written about every single day. War cyclones, and then you come back to the states, and you hear people talk about revival. How how do you balance the two? How do I balance the two? I don't know that I think about it. The only the only context I have for revival is hunger for Jesus. Hmm. I don't I don't think about revival here versus revival there. I think about being hungry and going and getting fed. <laughs> It's, re it's actually really profound. Like a lot of people think about revival as... I don't... Why Why would you compare revivals? I'm not comparing. I don't I don't know. I'm just I'm just trying to like... Yeah. I know when there's two... Hmm, there's two... We're two cultures, right? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times I think what we put on revival is like go to a meeting. People are coming. Oh, okay. Get yeah. touched, right? Yeah. Like, like revival, maybe Western 
revival. Mm-hmm. The revival out there. Yeah. Which is people are getting saved. Yep. People are getting healed, set delivered. free, delivered. All yep. the stuff that you see in the revivals here, but yep. two completely different yeah. scenarios, two completely different yeah. outpourings. Do yeah. you ever, does it weird you out when you hear people talk about revival and you've actually seen something totally different in this missional con- context? No. No? I just want people to be hungry for Jesus. I love it. Yeah. God, my judgy heart just is like, they're the worst. This is better. But yeah, I love that. Liz, you're holier than I am. <laughs> I don't think so. Not yeah, at all. you are. No, it's true. You're just like, it's just Jesus. Yeah. And it's actually what Rollins said. If you ever read Rollins' book, uh, Tending the Fire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. He talks about how most people, most people forget the reviver in the midst yeah. of revival, right? Yeah. And revival yeah. is about Jesus. It's not about. Yeah. The miracles, signs, and wonders. No. You've seen some crazy miracles over the years. Yeah. Crazy signs. Like, was it was it you who was sharing about the the two women that fled? Yeah. That, that they, escaped? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you mind sharing? I've shared it before, but sure. I, Not on here. You've shared it with me. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but there are other people watching this <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> And they've sure. never heard any of the stories. Yeah. Um, so, okay. <laughs> so one morning, um, we're gathered for prayer at the farm. Yeah. And these two women walk in. And similar to this gentleman that I just shared about, you know, they had just come out of fleeing an attack, we thought. And they were on their way to being, you know, placed in the camp. And they heard, there's a Macondi man that, that helps. Mm. Right? And uh, so they show up at the farm. And... Mario starts talking to them and we realized that yeah. that this one this one woman um she had been held captive she'd been kidnapped by yeah. by insurgents um yeah. which she thought probably a year 11 12 months ago she wasn't sure obviously just think about that yeah not far from us yeah and she just just got out and walks into our farm and her sister's with her um her sister hadn't been um kidnapped but her sister had come to find her they yeah. thought she was i mean she was missing when, when you say kidnapped right they're taken as slaves basically yeah as so th- they're to be used and abused by yeah. the soldiers her husband was beheaded in yeah. front of her i don't know if we're allowed to talk about this you stuff. can talk about whatever you want but there there was an attack her husband is beheaded in front of her her and her i think year old baby at the time are kidnapped by us. she's a beautiful woman mm. um and taken to be their slaves for lack of a better term. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, Mario's talking with her and we're kind of asking her her story. You can just tell there's like complete trauma on this woman's face, yeah. obviously. And she shares all about her time, you know, being held captive by by these men and just the awful things they did. You know, they, her her son was a, a year old yeah. when, when they were, when she was kidnapped and one of, you know, her, husband that she was given just hated this boy so one day he got up and and put him in a rice sack and you know ties up the rice sack and just starts slamming it against the concrete floor just trying to smash this baby's head in and he does that and then obviously the baby's screaming and he holds it up and there's you know blood dripping out of the sack and and he's just disgusted and so she's watching this and, and he reaches in and pulls the child out and it's alive and it's just it's got a head wound but it's alive and he's and he says this baby won't die and throws it at her i mean that's one of the stories she tells us and i'm looking at this child who's sitting there with her you know anyways a long story short they're moved around the insurgents are moving because rwandan troops are chasing them they're going from place to place so at one point this particular group of women are being guarded by a couple of insurgents. They're marching through the forest. They decide to make a run for it. They're over it. If they shoot me and kill me, fine. If we escape, fine. They make a run for it. Her and a couple of women escape. And she says, and we, we went two or three days into the, you know, without seeing anybody, didn't know where we were, just running through the bush. And she said, and then, and then these Rwandan soldiers, you know, appeared and they found us. And she says, and they were, you know, just really, really tall men, like, three meters tall and they had these bulletproof white uniforms on and so she's sharing all of this in Makandi and Mario's translating from Makandi into Portuguese and I'm tracking with him yeah. until he says that there's these three meter tall men yeah, nine feet in white bulletproof okay 
I know, we all know what a Rwandan soldier looks like. Yeah. One, they're not three meters tall. Two, if they're police division, it's all black. Mm -hmm. If they're military division, it's a, it's a forest green camo. No one in Mozambique is wearing snow white, yeah. bulletproof uniform, whatever. And so I was like, well, Amari, hold on. Have her translate that part again. Like, clearly you missed something here, mm -hmm. you know? So he asked her again and she says the same thing. Yeah, so three meters tall, white bulletproof uniform. And I'm like, no, 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 that that can't be right. Like, tell me what I want to hear because I know what the Rwandan soldiers look like. Yeah. So then Mario asks her a third time. And at this point, she looks at me realizing, like, I have the problem with her translation. <laughs> and she looks at me and she's like, they're this tall. Yeah. And the uniforms are the color of milk. I don't know what you <laughs> want to call the color of milk, <laughs> but they're the color of milk. Wow. And so these men lead them into <laughs> to Nangadi, Sedi, which is like, you know, um, a town center. And there they're picked up by probably proper Rwandans. Yep. And so they ask her like, do you have family? Where, where do you want to go? And she's like, I have no idea. So she gets a ride in one of their tanks and they drop her off in Miezi. So this is like two or three days, you know, drop her off in Miezi and she just walks out to the farm. And so I started asking her where she grew up. And this, this woman grew up in a very, very remote district. She can't make this stuff up. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so long story short, you know, um, she's been with us two years now. Been working she's with still us. there. Oh, she works with us. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah, she works with us, her and her boy. Um, Do you have a picture of her on your Insta? Uh, no, for her protection. I don't. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah. We want to be sensitive to that stuff. Um, she bought a piece of land. She's remarried. Stop. Yeah. I will tell you her name. Her name's Maria. She's lovely. And w what happened with the son? Yeah. So we, we rushed him into Pemba. He needed a blood transfusion. I didn't realize it. He was... He was about dead. Um, he was super sick, but but he's fine. He's fine. Yep. Wow. So the the nine foot tall Rwandans yeah. in white bulletproof and white bulletproof vests just saving, you know, people fleeing attacks. Yeah. And I think about the heavenly host a lot, and you know, Mario and I sometimes when when there's when there's hard days because there's some really hard days where we lose people, we have things come yeah. closer than we would like, um, we get calls that are just screams. You know, and then we get calls the next day that those screams are no longer with us. Yeah. And uh, we think about those heavenly hosts, you know, that they're yeah. out there, you know, that Jesus is there um, and he is rescuing and saving. He is. Yeah. And at the same time, you're burying people that you know and love, right? Yep. That, that I, I heard Heidi say it once, it stuck with me, you know, for years it was like, Lord, make me nameless and faceless and the reality is each and every one has a name and every single person has a face given by God. They're not nameless and faceless people. No. Right. And you're not nameless and faceless, right? Like no. you're out there doing this and these are our friends. Yeah. Right? These are our pastors. Yeah. These are, um, villagers, villagers from villages that we've been to. Mm -hmm. How do you handle, you know, we love the celebratory stories, right? Where, yeah. But how do you handle the, how are you handling? Gosh. Um, Seven years. It's a lot. Is Are you okay talking about it? You, you don't yeah, have to. Like I'm, you actually I'm okay talking to. about it. Because everybody goes through stuff. You've mm -hmm. been through stuff even before you were in Mozambique. Your mom yep. passed away. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to, are you okay with me sharing I'm, that? That's yeah. fine. That's fine. Yeah. Your father as well. Yeah. And there. So, in in Pemba. In Pemba. Yeah. And yeah. you can, if you listen to the Stephanie interview, the first part of the Stephanie interview, you can hear a little bit of that story. I didn't yeah. want to go over that again. Yeah. But, you know, you faced a lot before you became a missionary. Now you're facing a lot as you're a missionary. How do you handle that? Because I was over there. I mean, I get videos. I get, I see pictures. Yeah. I spent a week about two years ago was the last time I went. Yeah. And that week I was on edge the whole week. You know, you're parking the car in reverse into the driveway. You're making sure it has a full tank of gas. If you got to hit the road fast. Yep. How, 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 how do you handle that? Um, in the light, it, in the light of eternity. And, and that's, I don't want that to sound like a cliche, holy answer. I think about what is this in the eternal perspective, mm. right? So Paul says, it's a light and momentary suffering. Mm. And in seven years of war, it doesn't feel light. 
it doesn't feel momentary, right? In the flesh. Nothing's light about it. Right. It doesn't feel momentary. Mm. But <laughs> in eternity, yeah. it is achieving for us something that is far greater than anything we feel in our flesh, right? So I think about what is the eternal bride of Cabo Delgado right now? Yeah. Right? So uh, Mario one day on, on, on the farm, it was just a horrible day. And we, we had buried four people in one day that we knew. And we were sad. And he just looks at me and he's like, but the Cabo Delgado section of heaven is going to be so full. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's it. Right. This is light and momentary, you know. But what is eternal is far greater. And so, sure, I can, I can, I can hurt because it's real. I'll acknowledge it. Yeah. There's pain. Yeah. There's fear. Yeah. I feel afraid. Mm -hmm. But the eternity is with Jesus, the Lamb, who mm -hmm. was slain before the foundation of the earth. And the verse that I always, just my mind goes back to is that verse in Revelation. You know, he went down and he took the keys of Hades, right? Mm -hmm. So when you feel like you're in hell, when you see things that are beyond hellish, when you hear and are surrounded by those things, you think, yeah, but Jesus already went to that place and took those keys away. Mm. Those keys no longer belong to the enemy. Jesus holds that victory. So it's already been won. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. It's, it all, it, you can't give your life away for something if you're not living for eternity. Yeah. What, what are you living for then? Yeah, I'm with you. You're. I'm not living to see revival. I'm living to see Jesus. Yeah. I'm not living to see miracles. I'm living to see Jesus. So I think about eternity, and I think this is light and momentary. But I want these people with Jesus. I want them to have Jesus. Yeah. I want Jesus. I don't know. <laughs> it's amazing. So I think about that. And um, I think you, you talked about it earlier, you know, when Stephanie was here. Peace I leave you. Peace I give you. But not as the world does. Do not give to as the world gives. Yeah. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. No. Yeah. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. I have peace because I have Jesus. So I think a lot of people, I'm just going to try to play the person that's sitting there listening to this being like i can't handle that there's no way i can there's no way i could do that okay there's no way like i love jesus with all my heart all my soul all my strength and what you're talking about liz yeah seems like an impossibility yeah or well, there's a 15 year old or 18 year old wanting to go on missions that just yeah. heard you say that and is like uh i don't i can't do that yeah how what would you say to them you're right you can't <laughs> i can't uh, when I signed up to, to do this, first of all, I, I signed up to be a farmer to grow corn for Jesus. I didn't sign up for war. I didn't sign up for cyclones. I didn't sign up for any of that stuff. I didn't sign up to walk through I, I, in my mind. You know what I mean? You can't. But did you, give your, did you encounter Jesus or didn't you? Because if you encounter Jesus, you can go through anything because he will always be there. I didn't think I could... I didn't think I would ever come back on the mission field after my dad passed away. Mm. And then and there's several other things throughout throughout my time on the mission field that I that I would have never thought I could go through. But have I encountered Jesus? Yes. Does his word say, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Yes. Mm. Has he ever left me? No. Has he ever forsaken me? No. So you can. That 15-year-old can do those things and more. That person that's scared to go out on the mission field or has been hurt on the mission field or has experienced tragedy on the mission field can stay, can remain. Now, I'm saying, don't get me wrong, get healing. Oh, man, please. Yeah. Get healing. That's so important. We're huge proponents. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Huge. I, I, yeah, I have, I have had and still probably need, want. I want to be whole. Mm. I want to be whole. And I want to be holy. You can't be holy if you're not whole. Yeah. You know, it's Jesus. But you're right, you can't. Heidi, Heidi and Roland are phenomenal, but the reason they're phenomenal is because 
they've encountered Jesus and they seek his face every day. Yeah. So you can go through seven years of war and anything else. People have gone through way harder way things. Worse. Way worse. My Mozambican friends, I, I, I still live in Disneyland compared to the things they've walked through. And they have only done it because of Jesus, mm. you know? Um, I look at the Voice of the Martyrs guys. Man, their visit this year just wrecked me. Most powerful thing. They're so in love with Jesus. That's The persecuted church is the most joyful thing you could ever surround yourself with. Yeah. I, I love those guys, uh, Voice of the Martyrs, connecting with them, hearing their vision, hearing what they do. They literally exist to serve the persecuted church. That's all they do. That's all that they do. They just receive funds and they just take care of the persecuted church. Oh my gosh. And they have... I mean, they do a lot of other things too, but like that's the core. They have supernatural empathy Mm -hmm. that is just can only come from Jesus. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. Yeah, they live their life hearing stories. I showed a video to one of them. They said it was one of the... From Mozambique, he said it's one of the worst things he's ever seen in all of his years yeah of work and this is one of the one of the bom guys like yeah for him to say that they they literally deal with this stuff all the time he said this is one of the worst things i've ever witnessed and you've seen those things and more yeah the bible says my yoke is easy Mm -hmm, right my mm -hmm. burden is light Mm -hmm. but what does that mean to you in the midst of all this crazy heavy stuff uh, my yoke is easy. My burden, burden yeah, is light. Cause she, yeah. He's like, Hey, my yoke, take on this yoke. Yeah. Right. And you know, you know, a yoke is a farming implement. You, know, you stick it on two oxen. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. But what you're sharing is pretty heavy. Okay. Yeah. How do you navigate that? Um, you're yoked with God. I know that it's not, you're not yoked alone. No, no, no. But it sounds pretty heavy. The things we're living in and experiencing mm-hmm. and, and watching and, and witnessing are heavy. Mm-hmm. Spending time with Jesus is easy. Yeah. What does he ask of us? Just our whole heart. So his, it's easy to spend time with Jesus. It's light. Yeah. Yeah. Living with the Father, living together with him. That's not heavy. That's light. When I operate in the flesh, when I stay in my flesh, when I when I focus more on what I'm losing and what I'm not in control of, that's that's hard. That's heavy. That's it's kind of (laughs) yucky. Yeah. But Jesus in time with him is always, always sweet and always light. But also you can take heavy things to Jesus and you can be. I'm not saying every time I pray, it's just like this joy bomb that goes right. off. No, I'm, I'm just saying it's a light place to be with him when I'm alone with him. Mm. There's a lightness in his presence and yet a terrifying holiness there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, when I think his yoke is easy and his burden is light, I, I don't know if this is a hard connection or not a fair one, but I think of Job and, and when he questions God and God just answers and it's like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I spoke of things I did yeah. not understand, you know, and, and I think I just want to, I want to make Jesus feel loved. That's light. Come on, Liz. But okay. I have a lot of questions, but <laughs> I, I'm sure they're pretty stupid. No, um, ask them. I, I just, I'm just blown away. I, I really am. I'm blown away. I always am. And I know it's not you, it's Christ in you, but it's also you. And you're pretty great. And talk to me about the farm oh. real quick. Talk to me about the work that you're doing out there. The farm, the farm's beautiful. Uh, the farm is 126 acres. Mm-hmm. Um, we have 35 family members out there that mm-hmm. work with us. Um, that you disciple. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Um, we grow, I mean, we grow, we grow corn, we grow beans, we grow... Um, vegetables we grow sesame seed Mm -hmm. um we grow moringa um we put in a mill we've gotten into animal production yeah some of it we sell some of it's cash crop you Mm -hmm. know uh trying to be a little bit more sustainable yeah um sometimes we don't sell anything and we give it all away because there's a lot of hungry people yeah um 
Yes. <laughs> a lot of it goes into, so we still have our children's homes. So mm -hmm. our kids live in vill um, village housing now. Yep. But um, we grow food and send it in there. Um, but the farm, um, it's it's just an offering to Jesus. What's, yeah. What do you feel like, the, what vision do you feel like the Lord's giving you for the farm in the future? Like where do you want to see the farm five years from now? Uh, five years from now, I want to see it, you know, um, I want to see it more sustainable than it, than it is at the moment. Um, and I want to see it more active in our community. Um, so we kind of had a community just start growing around us, right? All of these yeah. kind of refugees that, you know, the government started placing around our, the land around us, right? right? So we have a really good relationship with the village at the moment. Um, we were able to come in and partner with them and build a, a primary school last year. Um, just trying to practically be there, you know, we're trying to get, you know, some medical stuff in there to help them out. Um, have a, just, you know, we, we do distribution. So mm -hmm. we have a distribution team, right? So Heidi goes out and does distribution, but then they, they kind of, the distribution team drops off, um, the distribution for us at the farm and then the farm workers and yeah. I, we do distribution yeah. to our little community. So we have a beautiful relationship with them. But, you know, if you ask me five years down the road, what do I want to see? I want to see all of our workers walking with Jesus. Yeah. And their families walking with Jesus, and I think if 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 your heart is with Jesus, then the work just flows from that. You know, yeah. if I look at a field and 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 it's not doing well, I, I look at the group of people and okay, where are their hearts right now? Because yeah. if your heart's right, your field's good. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have a cool opportunity at the moment. Our moringa powder that we make is going into a moringa peanut butter line that goes through all the VIP stores in Mozambique. Really? Yeah, it's crazy. Moringa peanut butter. I know it. Uh, doesn't taste that bad. Okay. It doesn't taste that good. Okay. <laughs> you think of peanut butter without sugar, like natural peanut yeah, butter, yeah. that's what it tastes like. It doesn't okay. have a moringa flavor. But there's a gentleman in, in the area, and he's making making peanut butter and wants to put moringa in it to help, you know, fight malnutrition. And so yeah. he came to us and was like, I want to buy all your moringa powder. I love and it. We were like, all right, let's do it. So cool. Um, there's something that you, that you do really well. Uh, it's uh, anytime I put you in front of, a school a class you know online uh, they like i said earlier they you be very quickly become one of their favorite speakers and i think it's because you do the practical really well like i remember you shared one of the schools of just like drink water like drink water you're so not good. drinking water right and you're like a lot of the issues you call satan is just because <laughs> you don't drink water and you don't sleep well yeah like yeah um my my son right he's he's uh he he just got back from Japan. He wants to do missions. My daughter, you know, there's this group. I was talking with Andy Bird, and he says 50% of all on fire, gen, whatever it is right now, 50% um, consider missions as a full time yeah. of like the on fire ones that they're seeing come out of Wyoming. 50% wow. like are considering missions as a full time opportunity calling mm -hmm. in their life. If, if you had 100 of these 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds sitting in front of you. Yeah. And they were like, we want to do missions. Mm -hmm. And there's just, what would you tell them? Uh, read your Bible. No, seriously. Fall in love with the oh, word. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fall in love with the word. You read your Bible, you're going to encounter Jesus. Um, and then I would say, learn to work. Uh, like, not, like, learn to work. You know what I mean? Can you chat about that? Yeah. Um, you're going on the mission field. And I don't know. All places, but most places, like, you're going to need to know a few things. Go learn how to change a tire if you don't already know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Go learn some basic electrical stuff. Your power is going to go out and things are going to short circuit. Just basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't go get yourself blown up. Right. Take a first aid class. Yep. If, if you're not comfortable in self-defense, go take a self-defense class. Have you had to defend yourself? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've not, I haven't hurt anybody. I I I did more than once <laughs> on the field. Just yeah. So I agree. I agree yeah. with everything you're saying. Yeah. I haven't heard this. I haven't heard you've had to. Well, when we did, when we like distributions got. Oh yeah. A yeah, little. Yeah. Yeah, a little intense a few times. Okay. Um, yeah. Do these things. All right. Like, be physically fit. Okay. And I'm not saying you got to run a marathon. I'm not saying you got to start lifting weights. Mm -hmm. But take care of yourself because a lot of these environments, like they're physically probably more demanding than where you're living mm. in your Western environment. So arrive healthy and keep yourself healthy. 
Drink water. Go to bed. Yeah. But read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Gosh, read your Bible. Yeah. Yeah. It's living and active. It will keep you from from sinning. You know, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Yeah. So when did you feel like you crossed over like the visit? I'm visiting Mozambique. Mm -hmm. I'm a fresh, like new, new, new person here to like, when did you feel like you fell in love with the, the nation and like, you're like, oh, I'm a, I'm now like an official missionary. I don't know. I, I Did you ever feel like a crossover where you're like, okay, let me let me ask. The reason why I'm asking this question yeah. is I actually don't consider someone a missionary. And to, I mean, this is me. This is me. I, this isn't something I put out there. And if you've done missions for a short term, I'm not saying you're bad. This is just me. Like, okay, you know, we we have a missional community. We have 500 missionaries yeah. right now around yeah. the globe, plus thousands of pastors and leaders. Like. I, I, I don't consider someone a missionary in my heart, like a little bit more tried until tried and true until they put like three to five years in. Okay. Yeah. Was there a moment where you cross where you're like, man, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Cause I think sometimes a lot of people go in with a short term mindset. They're like, I'm going to try this. I'm going to dip my toe in the water, go to this yeah. nation, go to this place. When were you, when did you go all in? Um, I, I was pretty, that's a weird question. I will say this, maybe change the question a little sure. bit. Sure. I realized I was okay with giving my life there. Like, okay, I'll I'll give my life. I'll die here mm-hmm. uh, during during the cyclones and distribution. Yeah. And for me, that changed something. It wasn't I'm here to serve. It was I'm here to lay my life down to the point of okay, I'm thinking through these scenarios that we're in. I'm thinking through my surroundings. This could end this way. It could easily go this direction. Am I willing to take that risk? Am I willing to lay this down here? Knowing what it would mean for my family or mm-hmm. how it would affect people. And when I felt in my heart like, okay, I will I will do that, that changed, it changed something in me. Right. And I think it's one thing to, to listen to people share and to listen to, you know, people that have been in those situations. But until you're there and you feel that, and you make that choice in your heart, it's, it's, it's different. You know, you can read the Voice of the Martyrs books and you can say, like, I'd love to give my life for Jesus. But when you're faced with a chance to do that and you choose to put yourself in a position where Jesus could rescue yeah. me and protect me mm-hmm. or he could choose to, to take me home and he's sovereign in both, you know, that even if he doesn't, mm. we won't bow type yeah. of thing. It, it it changed my heart like and i thought yeah i'm i don't know i'm in i love it i don't know do you feel like there's a time where you had to let some of your own like dreams that you had growing up for yourself you had to lay any of that on the altar mm, no okay i think i i just wanted my life to count for something yeah. you know i wanted to I wanted to do something in agriculture to to help serve and then when I wanted to do missions, I just wanted to help. I just wanted to love Jesus with 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 what I had. Yeah. Um, I will say I think I had to lay down some entitlement when my dad was, um, when he was taken when he passed away. I felt like grieving him exposed a lot of entitlement in my heart. Um, ex- what? Sorry, <laughs> that probably sounds weird. I don't understand. Um, Grieving your father yeah. exposed entitlement yeah. in your heart. Yeah. So you touched on it. My mom passed away when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, she had cancer and passed away when I was 12. And then grew up with, with my father um, and my sister in a single parent household. Now, my family was amazing. My aunts and uncles and grandma came in yeah. and they helped a lot. Um, and then I kind of had formulated this idea in my mind like, okay, I've been through something hard, I've suffered. Now Jesus is going to reward me. Right. And so then I go to mission school. And at the time of when I went to mission school, my, my dad had just kind of come back to the Lord. He went into some some dark places after mom passed away yeah. and wasn't really available, wasn't really walking with Jesus. Um, he got radically touched. Holler story comes back to Jesus, kind of brings me back to Jesus. At that point, when I'm doing mission school, my dad is like my best friend. Mm-hmm. Like we have found Jesus mm-hmm. together and we're growing and everything's exciting and new. 
like I said at Harvest School, I just wanted to learn about everything I could about Jesus, you know, and then making that decision. Okay, I give him everything, right? And my everything, like my dad was my my best friend. Yeah. And so going, I give you everything, and going out on the mission field and going all in. In week one, he takes my dad. How dare you, God? Mm. I gave you everything, and you took the one precious thing to me that I had. That's entitlement. You don't think that's a normal... I'm not disagreeing. I just want to talk about this for a second. Do you think that there's a normal process in that? I think... I Like a grieving process? I think grief is one thing. Yeah, but like even grieving... Yeah, grieving what's what's lost, right? Well, yeah, grieving, you can grieve what's lost. But I'm just talking about your father. I'm talking about the restoration. God restored this thing. But I wasn't owed that. I know that. Jesus that a, owes us That nothing. was a gift. Yeah. You know? That was a gift to me yeah. to have that restoration with my dad. It was a gift that I had an amazing dad. That totally. was a gift. I I agree. I'm I'm Yeah. But then okay, you you know Mozambique, how yeah. many people have lost way more right. than what we have? Right. So who am I? Entitlement says, Jesus, I, I I did a mission school and gave you my life, so therefore... I know. I uh, I agree I agree with you, and I hear you. It's just hard. And, I, and It's just hard to hear, if you want the truth. And I get it, and I would preach the same thing that you're saying right now. But you as my friend, and just yeah. maybe walking through that with my wife. Yeah. And Because I remember like when she came through cancer the first time. Mm -hmm. It was like, yeah, we beat it. It's good after. And then it comes back again. Yeah. I'm like, God, we did this already. Yeah. Like I'm it's yeah, it's very selfish to think that he owes me a good season after that. Yeah. I'm not owed a good season. Everything that that we've gotten is is a gift. Yeah. You know, it's his mercy, you know? Yeah. But he is the father. He's a good and father. And he loves to give good gifts to his children. Yeah. And so I agree, he doesn't owe us a good season, but man. In the midst of it, he does incredible things. Oh, my gosh. And, and, and does above and beyond. Yeah. But, yeah. Whew. I mean, and, and you said it. I've gotten to see and witness things, you know, far beyond what I ever dreamed or imagined yeah. on the mission field. He's He's been good. He's been good to me. He's challenging me. <laughs> Normally, I challenge people. No, I'm just kidding. I, 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 I This is why I love you, Liz, because you can say things that most people can't, and... Because they've never, they haven't put in the time or paid the price. Myself included. <laughs> right? Well, you've made this really fun. <laughs> this is just great. I feel good Come about on, all this. Come on, aren't you going to say something like? I don't have anything. I don't. I don't have anything. Okay. Yeah. It's it, the reality is, Liz. Like, <laughs> like the re, the reality is, you, you. Um, I've never. You're just pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> you're just pretty pretty awesome, and I love you a lot. Well, and a lot of people love you. And I know you're not perfect, and I'm not trying to lift you up, but yeah. I also call a spade a spade. You're a pretty yeah. awesome spade. Well. And uh, it's evident in the fruit of your life, how you talk, the way you speak of the Lord, the way you raise the these amazing girls that, mm -hmm. that you take care of. You're, you're one of the best disciplers I've met. Um, you are literally one of the hardest workers. I kind of want to arm wrestle you. Oh, Just, no, please don't. <laughs> you're like... You're, you're, you're just, you're just incredible. Wow. And you, if I had, if I, if Iris had 20 people, duplicates of you, the whole globe would be saved. Uh, you just really carry such an amazing thing. And listen, I want all of you guys who are, who are watching this, if they want to connect with you. Uh huh. Okay. How can they do that? They can shoot me a message on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. What's your, what's your gram? Glean dot nine. Okay, we're gonna stick it down in the description. Okay, and uh, so people can reach out and connect. Yeah. But if you're a weirdo, don't don't connect. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, but also, I want to say, like, I feel like we talked about a lot of heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. Missions is a lot of fun. It is. And, it is. And and 
I'm a joyful person. I think we went heavy and deep. No, it's but good, Liz. It's we need to go heavy and deep, fun. and we have a lot of fun here. And I love fun, but like yeah. the, this is the reality. That what is more fun than what is more beautiful? What is more good than His goodness covering yeah. everything? And He is the pearl of great price. And in the midst of suffering, He's, we, he's worth it. He's worth it, and yeah. there's joy. And but man, like I actually don't mind a sobering moment. Okay. Like I'm the goofy jump around. Yeah, you are. I am. But I feel like, bad because this got no, really no, no. Heavy. Like I, I actually can be serious. Okay. And I think it's really beautiful, and I want to let people nibble yeah. on this. Yeah. Right. Right. I do. Because I think I think the, the the Western Church needs to hear this. <laughs> the church in general needs to hear this, Liz. We make it very much about ourselves. Yeah. And, uh, I think you know. Steph did a really good job of addressing that. Like, it's not about us. Isn't it? Isn't it cool how you see someone like Steph, right? Yeah. Who isn't living the life, right? Like, as far as living in Africa in the bush and you right. Know, but she's like living this same passionate zeal here in right. America. That's why I say there's no yeah. comparison. What's the difference between Steph and this man that encountered Jesus? Their hearts are both on fire. There's no difference in her personal revival and his personal revival. Yeah. There's no difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. It's <sighs> cool. You're so freaking pure. My heart is bitter <laughs> and cold like this coffee I'm drinking. <laughs> what? Who are your heroes? Uh, don't don't say Jesus. We already know that answer. Mario. Yeah. My dad. Mm. My grandma. Why your grandma? My grandma, who's 101, um, because she has lived a life of devotion to the Lord mm -hmm. and steadfast prayer. And she has walked through so much and just the most steady person you will ever meet. Mm. I mean, she was born in 1922, lived through the Depression, acts like it was no big deal. Lives through World War II, and she's a nurse. It's no big deal. You know, she had six children, and she lost some of them. Acts like it's no big deal. Like, her devotion to Jesus mm. is the most pure thing. She's my hero, you wow. know? She has loved Jesus with all of her heart, and she prays for us every single day. You know, and I, uh, Jesus is like, I think there's something powerful, you know, about praying parents or grandparents, right? Yeah. It's it's just she's she's my hero. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Um, what do you need in Mozambique? I'm asking. What do we need? Yeah. Uh, we need a grinding mill. So like a hammer mill that takes corn and makes it into corn flour. Okay. We have a small one. We need a bigger one. Okay. What yep. else do you need? Uh, tractor tires. Okay. Yep. What else do you need at the farm? Um. That, that's what comes to mind off the top of my head. Yeah. Nothing else? We got lots of solar Bibles. We got lots of we always printed need off more Bibles. We give them. It's give true. More. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Well, I, if anybody's watching, you got tractor tires and solar Bibles <laughs> and a grinding mill, <laughs> stick them in a container and send them over to Liz. Please. Yeah. And yeah. the team over there. Yeah. Um, I love you, Liz. Love you I, too. I, the, I actually am speechless. I feel like I'm all the questions I ask are just surfacey. And I just think the world of you and thank you for coming on. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. And, and I've wanted to tell you, thank you for a while for this, but it's, I'm going to, I'm going to take a chance now. Cause you said there's people watching and you can't see them, but they're, they're there. Here. Yeah. Um, thank you, especially for showing up two years ago in those cyclones and for being with us. Like you and Sean flew in mm -hmm. And you said yes to some pretty th scary things in the natural that were God. And, you know, being under leadership that will always say yes to Jesus no matter what is such an honor. Yeah. And I think you speak a lot and you share amazing words, but I think people also need to know, like, you you live a life that backs that up, too. Thank you. So I want to say thank you to you. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. I love it. It's an honor. Uh, running with you during the Cyclones was awesome. <laughs> and uh, the island... Were you on the helicopter? Oh my gosh, that was my first helicopter ride. Yeah. That whole thing was Scared like supernatural how we got the helicopter. Oh. And uh and landed in some crazy places, went to some crazy places, still go to crazy places. 
Yeah. I, I, yeah, I love you. And I uh, think the world of you, listen, guys, if this blesses you and if it, if it didn't bless you, you're dead in the heart and uh, just, you should, you should go get your heart checked. No, if this blesses you, send this to someone that needs this. Um, send this to any, any uh, person that wants to get admissions. I think it's a really great word and I think they need to hear it. And if you want to reach out links, links yeah. in the description and I'm going to put this out there. Uh, if you, if you want to support Liz, which I, I, whatever, you're my friend and this is my podcast. I don't care. And I don't do this. I think I've maybe done this once. Um, but I could care less. Uh, I'll do it as much as I want on the Irish global website. Um, there is a link. And if you feel led, I want to encourage you, uh, as you know, as you can tell, Liz is the best soil out there and do that. Bless you guys. We'll see you on the next Iris Global Green Room. Liz, you crushed it. <laughs>